So um, I'm proposing that we start um, what is our third um, session um, with businesses. Um, because of the number of people on the call, we've got it um, muted to people who are coming in. Um, but there are various ways um, in which people can um, submit comments. So we've, uh, you can do that via social media. Um, you can do it via the um, email address um, that I'll ask someone to, to, to read out in a second that we've been advertising on, on social media. And we've already gathered quite a number of questions um, which we will respond to. And anything that comes in live throughout the session will respond to at the end. So um, either um, Anne or Hilary, do either of you just want to give the details that people can use to, to contact us? And um, the email address is businesscovid19 at tumbridgewells.gov.uk. Thank you very much indeed. So um, we've got a number of uh, people on the line, um, and I'll, in a second I'll come to them and ask them to introduce themselves and make some opening remarks. We've got Greg Clark, the local MP. We've got Ross Feeney, who's the chief executive of uh, Royal Tunbridge Wells Together, the business improvement district. Uh, we've got Sheila Coburn, who um, is here to answer questions about eligibility criteria for the, for the business rate grants and discounts. Jane Feynman from our finance department, who can talk a bit about how we're getting on with making the payments. And we've got Terry Hughes, um, who's from our um, community safety team, um, to pick up some, some of those issues as well. So if I could perhaps start off by just um, inviting um, Greg just to introduce himself and say a few words. Uh, thank you, um, folks, and thanks, William, for organizing uh, this call. Um, there have been a few developments um, that I think you're aware of since we last have had one of these calls, uh, one of which is that the furloughing scheme uh, is now open from the beginning of this week. Um, the, the payments uh, will be made within six working days uh, of the information being uploaded onto the, uh, onto the website. Um, the, the furloughing scheme has been extended from its original intended expiry of May uh, until June uh, now. Uh, and so, so that, is, that is functional. Um, the, the website seems to be holding up. There was some concern that it might be deluged and therefore fall over. If anyone has any problems with that or any of the other schemes, then uh, please let me know um, so I can take it up with the department's concerned. On the self-employment uh, scheme, there was a confirmation uh, that's been made in recent days that that will open in mid-May and payments will be made uh, in June. Um, obviously, the, uh, the, the grants uh, paid by, uh, through the local authorities are being paid out. I think we're going to go on to talk about uh, that. Uh, there are, and I know from talking to many people on the line and, uh, and beyond, um, there are uh, many different uh, areas that need to be improved, particularly for the self-employed, um, the position of directors of limited companies uh, and those earning just above the, uh, the £50,000 uh, cut-off um, are points that I'm uh, taking up with the, the Treasury and hope to have more flexibility on. There are categories of businesses that I think need to uh, to have a, a better appreciation of their needs. I'll, I'll mention the, the travel trade, um, in which there are lots of people who are wanting refunds, uh, wanting to cancel holidays, which means that you can't simply furlough every member of staff in a way that some businesses can. They need to be paid to deal with customers, but there isn't a, a scheme that, that, that targets that in a way that uh, I think should be the case. Uh, and finally, and just briefly on the uh, on the, the loan scheme, the Sybil's loan scheme, um, multiple problems I'm picking up from constituents uh, with that, notwithstanding changes made to make it more straightforward. Uh, and I'm finding that the banks are being uh, very uh, cautious, uh, indeed, to put it charitably, in terms of their uh, acceptance of applications. That is not, in my view, in the spirit uh, of it, and I'm looking for an opportunity to raise that on the floor of Parliament uh, to try and get some uh, reform to that. Thank you very much, Greg. Um, Ross, do, do you want to come in and introduce yourself? 
Yes, thank you, Greg. Um, good afternoon, everybody that's on the call. Thank you for being part of this. Um, I, I just wanted to start by uh, thanking all those businesses and furloughed staff that um, are currently supporting the NHS and other uh, key workers. Um, there's been some fantastic stories of businesses really stepping up from hotels like the Russell Hotel, providing accommodation for key workers and our homeless uh, residents, right through to retailers offering key worker discounts and um, restaurants like Vittel and Swig that are in, in the process of um, raising funds to prepare over 9,000 meals. Um, I'd also like to say well done to the businesses that are remaining open. It's a very difficult uh, climate to be working in. Um, we've got a, a sizable number of retailers that are still opening, providing essential goods uh, and or offering deliveries. And I've spoken to a number of those this morning and they're all uh, confirming that they're doing a, a good trade. Um, some of those like Sankey's on Vale Road, Fuggles Beer Cafe on Grosvenor Road, Jeremy's Home Store on Monson Road and Rendezvous Restaurant on Camden Road are all, are all reporting uh, that they're doing a, a really great trade. Um, for those businesses that are offering deliveries, um, we're doing a lot of promotion on social media through our Twitter, Instagram and Facebook accounts um, with both sort of paid and organic um, posts. We're also using the hashtag TWDelivers. Uh, and supporting the website twdelivery.co.uk, which is a free resource for businesses to uh, list themselves on if they're if they're open or are providing deliveries. Um, if for those businesses that are on the call, if you're not on that website and you are open and offering deliveries, um, there really isn't any reason why you shouldn't be on there. Um, it's very easy to list your business, and it, it, as I said, it's in, entirely free, um, being supported by a local web designer. Um, so in, in terms of what we're doing, um, just touching on some of the, the, the points that Greg has already made around rateable values, we know that there are a lot of companies that are not covered by any of the grants because they're not in the retail, hospitality or leisure sectors. Um, there's currently a national campaign that's been launched by bids called RaiseTheBarCampaign.com, uh, which is lobbying government to raise the threshold for grants from 51,000 rateable value up to 100. 50,000. Um, that seems to be getting quite a bit of traction. Um, our argument is that that also needs to cover all sectors, not just those, those three that are uh, benefited at the moment. Um, in terms of what we're doing, I've covered this before, but it's, it's worth saying again, please do go to the twdelivery.co.uk website. We'll also be hosting um, a webinar of our own next Thursday, the 30th of April at 10.30, um, which will be specifically for levy pairs. And we'll have an expert panel providing advice and guidance on how businesses can cope through the lockdown, but also how to prepare for when we, we are out of it or we start to phase our way out of it. We're doing quite a lot of social media promotion uh, at the moment. And we also have our WhatsApp group, which is open, it's a private group, but open to all levy pairs. Um, if you're not on that, um, we've got about 65 and, and a growing number. It's really great, not, not just as a tool for me to be able to disseminate information quickly, but it's also really great for our levy pairs to, uh, to benefit from peer-to-peer -peer support from one another where they might not be able to uh, already. So any business that wants to join that just needs to message 07 808 646 758. I think that's it for me for now. Thank you, Ross. William. Thank you. So, um, Sheila and Hilary, do you want to introduce yourself, or do you want to do that when you start the your session? I'm happy to introduce myself now. So, my name is Sheila Coburn. I'm head of revenues and benefits. I'm responsible for business rates, and hopefully, we'll be able to answer some questions on eligibility. And Jane. Hello, I'm Head of Finance um, and I'll try to answer your questions on actually issuing the grants. Perfect. And last but not least, Terry. Yep, thank you, William. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Terry Hughes. I'm the Community Safety Manager at Tunbridge Wells Borough Council. Uh, in normal times, I work in the Community Safety Unit in the Town Hall, along with the rest of my team, a number of police officers and the Safe Town Partnerships Business Crime Manager. We have strong links to many other services as well, including social landlords, domestic abuse services, youth service providers, fire and ambulance, drug and alcohol rehab agencies, 
uh, and of course the CCTV control room. Uh, we receive funding from the Police and Crime Commissioner and the Borough Council. And as a unit, we try to focus on specific themes highlighted by an annual assessment of crime and antisocial behaviour. Typically, our priorities revolve around domestic abuse, road safety and antisocial behaviour. But on a day to day basis, our remit is very broad and we try to prioritise issues that may cause the most harm or offer the highest risk or the biggest threat uh, to the people who live, work uh, or visit our borough. And that's me. Perfect. Thanks very much indeed, Terry. So um, what I'll then do is I will turn straight to the questions and I will. Um, um, I think we're going to start just talking a bit about business grants. So before I bring in um, Sheila and Jane to give us an update, I thought I would just say a couple of words. So the, um, there has been some publicity where the government asked authorities um, for information on the, the number of the amount of grant that's been sent out. I think the government themselves have accepted there is are some inconsistencies and errors in that. Um, and we're reported as being very far behind other districts, both in Kent and, and nationwide. Um, the, the, the position at the moment is that we have um, paid out 83% um, of the grants that have been applied for and that are eligible to be paid. So those that haven't failed the various fraud measures um, that are in place. Um, the, um, we're working very, very hard to get the rest out and we're hoping we'll have um, the bulk of them out by the end of the week. Um, and w one of the reasons that we're looking kind of poor relative to others is that we've got a much larger number of businesses than most. Um, and, the, and also we've had a fairly low percentage of people apply. So I think just 63% of businesses have applied. We've written to everyone where we've got an email, we've sent emails, where, we've, where we haven't, we've written um, by post. And we're also starting this week a ring round um, and another kind of um, round of getting in touch with businesses to try and drive um, up the numbers who are actually applying for it. So I, I wanted to apologise for, for any delay um, that there's been in getting it out. But we are, um, you know, we've, we've got people from right the way across the council helping in this effort to, to get it out. So I'm going to hand over to, to Sheila and Jane, who are going to talk a little bit on where we are with, with getting grants out and some of the frequently asked questions we've had coming in. Yes, I mean, um, we we talked uh, a little bit earlier about trying to give you a, a little bit of an update. As William said, we've had an application rate of 63% um, and we're, we're working now very, very hard to try and contact the remaining uh, companies. We're doing that by email. We're also phoning people. And for some people, we don't have either a phone or an email. Um, so we're Googling those details to try and find those, those folk to, to give them a call. Um, William also said we've now paid 83% um, um, of the grant money of those applications who were indeed eligible um, and that equates to 971 grants that we've issued and 13.85 million pounds um, so not not an insubstantial uh, amount to have have administered um, it's really important that we carry on with the momentum and we have been emailing and calling uh, those people for whom we need further bank detail evidence. Um, and people have been very, very good responding on the whole. Um, the main reason why if people had applied early but haven't yet received their money would be because they haven't responded to either the email or the phone call and haven't yet provided their bank details. Um, so those we are we are chasing daily and we're making payment runs daily as well uh, for both the 25,000 and the 10,000 pound grants. Thank you, Jane. Sheila, are you going to come in? Yes, I'll, I'll come in. Thank you. Um, so, um, some, some people, just some questions that people have asked. Um, 
and James answered the, uh, the question about a large number of people yet to apply. Um, if people do fail to apply, we've been asked if Tunbridge Wales Borough Council can keep the money for its own use. The answer to that is no. Um, if we have any money left over from uh, what's been paid over to us by the government, then that will be repaid to the government. Um, and, and we've also been asked um, if uh, Tunbridge Wales Borough Council have any funding or any scope for looking into funding. Um, we don't, I'm afraid. Um, the same question has been answered of the bid company, so perhaps um, Ross could just um, deal with that a bit later on. There is an appeal process in place um, for those people where a grant has been refused and people should um, go to the business COVID-19 at tunbridgewales.gov.uk email address. But the appeal process isn't for those that are clearly outside the grant scheme. So if your rateable value is uh, 51,000 or over, then you, you don't qualify at all and we've got no discretion over that. So uh, we won't be able to accept appeals on that basis. We've had some questions where people think they're eligible, but they haven't had a letter from us. Um, we, as Jane said, we've, we've emailed and sent letters, but if you think you are eligible, please contact the COVID-19 email address uh, with your name, address, and um, your business rates account number, if you've got it to hand, and we'll try and make some inquiries as to why you haven't received a letter, and then we can come back to you <clears throat> with an answer. Um, some, somebody said, I'm eligible for small business rate relief, but I currently don't receive this. Uh, yes, you can, can I apply for it? Yes, you can apply for it. Um, and um, I'm not quite sure why you wouldn't have applied for it in, in the first place, but by all means, go to the um, COVID-19 email address and um, we can have a look at that for you. I've also been asked, are charities um, eligible for the small business rate uh, grant? Uh, charities receiving charitable rate relief can't be eligible for small business rate relief, but they may be eligible for the grant if they come under retail, leisure or hospitality. Some other questions that have come through, uh, people don't have their bank account, their, sorry, their business rates account number. Uh, we did send out letters and I appreciate some people might not be able to get to their business uh, to get the letter. Um, those who receive their business rates bill electronically, we have been emailing those people. I would suggest uh, you email the COVID-19 inbox and then we can investigate that for you um, and see uh, whether or not we'll be able to um, try and find uh, details to confirm that we can give you your business rates number. Um, finally, somebody just mentioned that um, they've changed their name on Companies House and would that be enough to change the rate records? We would also expect to see um, other bills and bank statements just, just to confirm that. Um, and I think that's probably all the questions that have come through about eligibility. Thank you. There was just one um, which asked about the system. I'm not sure whether this is one for you or Jane, but saying when you enter your nine digit rates account into the online form, it tells you it's not a valid number. Can someone I, take that up? Yes, yeah, that, that would be for me. And um, if it's not a valid number, the, the when ratepayers fill in the form, there's a validation behind the scenes that recognises the number if it's a genuine uh, claim. If somebody's put in the, the wrong number or the, it doesn't recognise your number, then please get in touch with the COVID-19 email and we can have a look at that for you. Perfect. All right. So th there may be some more that are coming in. So, so stay on the line, um, both Sheila and Jane, uh, and I'll come back to you. Um, but what I'll do now, if that's OK, is I'll put some um, questions about government support um, to Greg. Now, um, as I've made clear in the last two sessions, um, Greg isn't, um, uh, um, he isn't part of the government ministerial team, but he has been lobbying and advocating very hard, hard on our behalf. So, Greg, um, the, the first question is around business interruption loans um, and a concern that biz many businesses trying to take on a loan were either turned down, given unfavourable rates of interest that made the loan untenable or couldn't afford to take on um, further debt. So is there any up, further update you can give on that? 
Well, um, so I think this is a good example uh, of an initiative that was uh, was launched with good intentions, but in practice um, has not had the impact that was intended. And my view is that it needs quite a comprehensive reboot. So I'm going to look for an opportunity uh, now. Parliament is back in virtual form to uh, to confront the uh, the Chancellor and the Treasury with the need for a kind of radical reform. Um, Many people on this call and uh, many other constituents have been in touch to say that they've uh, applied for loans uh, through their banks uh, and either the banks uh, are almost impossible to, to get through to a decision maker. Um, uh, one, uh, one constituent told me that the, uh, their relationship manager has been furloughed and not replaced, which um, doesn't seem to be uh, in the spirit of the, the times of uh, helping businesses out. Um, or where people have been able to get through to a decision maker, the, this question uh, as to whether the business is viable after the crisis uh, has been interpreted in a very, in my view, kind of restrictive way. Um, and it's very difficult to, to be able to predict the circumstances uh, after the, the crisis, not least because we don't know how long it's going to last. So my view is that it needs to be uh, made clear by the government that there is an expectation that just as with the furloughing scheme, that this is something that is designed to get money into the hands of businesses to keep them afloat. That same spirit needs to apply, and I will uh, push on that. Uh, there have been some changes that have been made. Um, one was that uh, it is now uh, possible to go uh, straight to the uh, the, the C bill, the, the business loan uh, interruption uh, scheme, backed by the government uh, to 80%, rather than applying for a commercial loan first. Uh, and the second is that personal guarantees uh, can't be taken uh, for loans up to a quarter of a million pounds. Um, uh, during until there's any change in the the national scheme, uh, then the practice of different banks does vary. And so, if anyone on the call has is having a bad experience with a particular bank, uh, and you're one of my constituents, then do email me, and I will take it up with the uh, the head office uh, of the bank concerned, uh, and try to to get fairer treatment there. Um, but you know, fundamentally. Uh, it seems to me that the spirit of this scheme should be to get money into the hands uh, of businesses, and it is clearly not working uh, as it should be. All right. Um, th uh, thanks very much, Greg. Um, we've also had some questions about tenancy and landlord issues, um, and businesses complaining that landlords are demanding rents um, and um, uncertainty about tenancy agreements and whether they include rates, which would entitle – it's two questions. Let's take one at a time. So, so the first is that landlords demanding rents when, when businesses can't afford it. And the second is a question as to whether if a rent includes rates, would those um, businesses be entitled to receive some of the grants? Well, um, so this is, uh, this is a tricky uh, issue. So there has been – uh, guidance that uh, that evictions um, should not take place uh, during the, uh, the the period of the of the crisis, but not that the uh, that there should be rent holidays that need to be granted by the landlords. Uh, and the reason for this uh, is probably clear to to everyone that you know, there are businesses whose business uh, is to uh, to rent out property, be that commercial property. Uh, or residential uh, property, uh, and probably some people on this call uh, have been in touch, concerned about their ability to uh, to continue to to trade. Um, so, so there isn't a a requirement, there isn't a a provision uh, to you know, to prevent landlords uh, asking for rent. Uh, it's down to conversations uh, with each. Uh, individual landlord. Now, I, I'm aware uh, in Tunbridge Wells that there has been, on the part of some landlords, quite a kind of pragmatic uh, approach taken to this, uh, including uh, not demanding rent uh, on the nail and, in some cases, reducing rent and having rent holidays. But they are negotiated between the landlord uh, and, the, uh, and the tenant. 
Okay. And then I'm not sure this is one for you or Sheila, but those circumstances where a business just pays rent um, and potentially the person to whom they're uh, paying rent receive, uh, pays the business rates and therefore receives the grant, whether that grant comes to, to them or, or the, 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 uh, the, the sort of company, the entity that, that pays the business rates. And I suppose the answer to that, is, Sheila will correct me if I'm wrong, it will go to whoever pays the business rates. That, that's First, absolutely right. Be, yeah. But yes. presumably there could be circumstances where there's a debate as to whether, you know, within that contractual arrangement, the money should be handed down. I'm not really sure that's something we can comment on, is it? No, that would be for the um, the landlord and the tenant to, to decide between them. We can only pay the ratepayer, which in most cases would be the landlord. All right, thank you. So, Greg, another one for you then on insurance, uh, where people are concerned about inconsistency in the definitions and exclusions of business interruption policies, and it's something we've spoken about on the previous two calls. Any update on that or any thoughts on that? No, I've been talking to... Um, to Treasury Minister uh, and uh, the Association of British Insurers are here. Again, I think there needs to be a greater consistency of approach. Um, there is too much deviation in practice between uh, individual insurance uh, companies. Uh, my view is that the ABI should, should establish uh, a, a clear set of interpretations of standard clauses. Um, but Obviously, as a trade body, they uh, they're not in they don't have the ability to impose on their members. Um, but I hope that they will see the the benefits, not least reputationally, of uh, of having a fair and consistent approach. So, but I'm afraid there's uh, I've got no uh, no news to uh, to convey from the Association of British Insurers or the Treasury on that. All right, thank you very much. So I, I've got um, a few questions about people who are falling between the cracks. And I've had quite a few um, separate questions on this, and some have come on um, whilst we've been on the call. So the question is about directors that take dividends um, are unsupported outside of the business interruption loan. Um, do, do you want to comment on that? Yes. So, I mean, this is a, a good example of schemes that were announced, both the furloughing scheme and then the, uh, the self-employment uh, scheme. They were announced in... Uh, in broad brush terms, and, uh, and actually in the case of both of them, but especially the furlough scheme, they, they're much more extensive, much more radical than I think many people were expecting. And internationally, they're now being uh, emulated, or if not emulated, actually people are doing things in a way that is not as compre comprehensive. Um, but they've been announced in broad brush terms, and they uh, they have exceptions, people falling between the cracks. And I think uh, in terms of the, the self-employed and small businesses, uh, company directors um, are one of the principal categories there. Um, so it is, there has been some clarification that you can, if you're a company director and you take part of your income through PAYE, uh, you can furlough yourself uh, and and take the 80% the uh, of your PAYE income while still being able to, to discharge your legal obligations as company director. So that has been uh, made clear that you can, uh, you can do that. Uh, however, uh, the, uh, there, hasn't, there hasn't been a change uh, that would allow dividend income to be recognized and treated uh, as prior income uh, such as uh, would have been paid uh, either on people's tax returns uh, or on through the PAYE system. And I know this is something uh, that uh, is exercising company directors right across the company who, for perfectly uh, understandable reasons, and sometimes have been required to organize their their companies in that way to uh, required by the, uh, the clients that they work for. Uh, that is a... A gap. I don't want to mislead people into uh, uh, saying that there's, there's some imminent resolution to that because I and others have been putting that uh, case to the Treasury and so far they have they've rejected it and said that the, the difficulty of distinguishing between the dividend income that shareholders generally make and those uh, from 
in effect self-employed people uh, is too open to uh, the mistakes and potential abuse. I think there are ways around that, not least by referring to uh, past records, but that is the uh, the view that the Treasury are taking uh, so far on this. Um, Martin Lewis, the, the money-saving expert who's um, on the TV quite a bit, uh, he has uh, followed this uh, closely. Um, and uh, for anyone that is self-employed, actually his website, moneysavingexpert.com, he's got some uh, videos that are, uh, are geared to company directors of small businesses uh, and indeed others. He's a very good uh, communicator, and, and if you find the uh, the official guidance um, a bit bewildering, although I think it's uh, on the government website, gov.uk, it's clearer than, than most, but he captures it in a way that uh, I think is uh, is crystal clear, and it's worth, it's worth going to that. And, and just on that, Greg, in, in the past 20 minutes, he's tweeted out saying that if you're self-employed and you haven't submitted your tax return for last year obviously it would be very late if you haven't you have to do it today to be eligible for the self-employment income support scheme um, if you miss that deadline today you won't get anything so i think that's a that is know, very good reminder for everyone absolutely yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and you know i don't think you need to comment on this but in pressing the case um one questioner has said that you know the fact that dividend income isn't included completely ignores the fact that business owners are putting their own money and necks on the line start a business grow it from scratch long hours no sick pay holiday pay or other employee benefits so um you know i, I think you, you've kind of addressed the question but it is certainly something people feel strongly about um so the next question I is think, about sorry yeah, i was just going to agree with you william i think the Different small businesses organize themselves in different ways, and there are many businesses that you know, perfectly, properly choose to do it in, in that way, uh, and they work no less hard, pay no less in taxation uh, often, and certainly take uh, the same personal risks that people in other forms of business do, and I think it's right that that should be recognized. Okay, so a few more questions then. Um, so one around the newly self-employed, especially gig economy workers who've been left behind um, outside of, of university credits, sorry, universal credits? Any well, there is provision um, for, uh, for people who've been on zero hours contracts um, to, to continue to be paid under the furlough scheme. That was uh, a clarification that, that was made after the launch uh, of the scheme. Uh, and the, there has been a, uh, a change in the, the cut-off date uh, for people who were starting uh, new jobs. Um, but for, for people beyond the 19th of March, which is the, uh, the new deadline, uh, that, is the, uh, that is the cut-off for the, the furloughing scheme. Uh, beyond that, then it is the uh, the other sources, the universal credit that uh, that new applicants will have to uh, access. Okay, thank you. Um, and a question about cash flows. Um, I guess it's a point really that the um, businesses with precarious cash flows, um, who would have been fine in normal circumstances, but who don't qualify for a loan or can't get it, are at great risk of of not trading in the future. Um, and you know that some of them are very desperate and and, and may not survive the, the, the lockdown period. So. Yeah, you know, I think well, that's just. And this goes to the loan uh, scheme, which is which is there to provide uh, cash flow help. I mean, there are some other contributions to to cash flow. I think, as um, uh, callers will be aware, such as the the deferment of um, uh, of tax uh, payments um, and uh, and and help with the some of the timings uh, of that, and obviously the the business rates uh, relief that has been uh, introduced. But um, but obviously that only goes so far, uh, and the loan aspect is uh, is crucial for cash flow, uh, as is the uh, the furlough scheme generally was uh, had two purposes. One was to uh, to keep people in employment whose uh, whose skills we'll need uh, afterwards when we come out of this. Uh, but the second was to keep those businesses uh, afloat as well, because if they were having to uh, to pay for people, uh, then then clearly that they couldn't do that and would have to put themselves into uh, insolvency. So. Uh, uh, so that is one contribution to it, but in my view, that the, the loan system needs to be uh, geared up to to help with more of the cash flow needs that people are facing. 
Okay. And uh, just a question also about new startups not being eligible. I think there was something on this recently, wasn't there? Yes. So there is a new package that um, is going to be available uh, for uh, for new startups. Uh, if anyone, uh, if you go to the gov.uk slash coronavirus uh, website, you'll find the details of that. As with these other schemes, it's kind of launched uh, in headline terms um, and the details uh, will be published during the days ahead. But if anyone has any particular uh, interest in that, uh, contact me and I will make sure that you get the information as it comes out. Okay, perfect. And then I've got a few just about um, the kind of parameters of the various schemes. Uh, so what one person asking about um, the, um, I think we had this last time, about that cap of 51,000 for the um, discount and, and, and the grant scheme and whether, um, you know, that's an absolute cap and, and what about those above the cap who, who might be marginally above the cap, um, sometimes competing with businesses marginally under the cap um, who've historically yeah. paid more. So, um, you know, the question is whether there's any light you can shed on why the ceiling was used. So the ceiling was used for uh, simplicity. These, these schemes were, uh, were got up and running and put out, uh, obviously, at very short notice. And, and I know that there was a big imperative just to, to get them out, to get them up and running and to get money in people's bank accounts. One of the ways to do that is to have very simple rules. But the trouble with very simple rules uh, is that they can be uh, they can be very rough justice for people who are one side of them or another. Uh, in general, I think uh, caps with a uh, with a hard number uh, attached to them uh, with that kind of cliff edge, uh, I think, are unfair. And a taper is much better. So whether that's uh, for uh, the, the the question of rateable value that you just uh, put to me, where, where fifty one thousand uh, is the cap, I think to have a taper that that withdraws uh, relief and the grants gradually uh, above that, or indeed going back to the self employed uh, question, the the fifty thousand pounds cap for self employment uh, income, uh, again the difference between someone who's earned in previous years. Forty-nine thousand five hundred pounds, and someone that's earned fifty thousand five hundred pounds uh, is uh, is a small amount in terms of people's uh, experience. Uh, and rather than have a, a total cut off, you you get the support if you're less than fifty thousand pounds. You don't if you're above it. Uh, I think to taper that uh, would have been, and I still think would be uh, a better uh, system. I've uh, I've written to the Chancellor, in fact, I put it to him personally in a conversation uh, I had with him uh, and asked him to to consider that as they're making refinements to, to these schemes. Okay, and then, then um, another, um, a few other points, I, I guess, just for you to make in future conversations with the Chancellor. So someone has asked about uh, relief not being extended to other businesses who, whilst they don't have a high street presence, are as affected. So the example uh, in question was uh, an importer and wholesaler of giftware, mostly supplying high street retailers. So whilst they don't have a high street presence, um, they are reliant upon the high street, you know, shops that are currently closed in order to trade. So I guess that's just a point for you to, to make in your, your lobbying. Absolutely. So there are, uh, as I mentioned earlier, different sectors with different challenges. And again, there's a kind of rough justice to, to this. If you're, if you're supplying high street retailers uh, that are closed and can't sell your wares, then your impact is just as much as the, uh, as the shop that is, uh, is selling your products. I can completely see that. Uh, again, these schemes that were rushed out uh, were broad brush in their approach. So it was retail, hospitality, and leisure. You know, relatively easy to define, or not not perfectly easy to, to to define, but actually there are businesses that are equally affected. Um, but drawing a set of definitions, uh, unless you include every business in the economy, is is obviously more difficult than than painting with a broad brush. But I recognise the you know, the injustice that that anyone in that situation uh, will feel. Uh, and there have been changes and additions to eligibility for 
the grants and the uh, and the business rate discounts that have uh, that have come in, and I will make the case on behalf of particular businesses uh, and their sectors. Obviously, it has to be done on a sectoral basis uh, where there's a compelling case for that. All right, thanks very much. And, and there was another one about um, someone who doesn't have a physical. I think it's a similar point about who doesn't have a physical location, but maybe operating from home um, or elsewhere. Um, do you know about the? So another question that's been asked is about the planned rates revaluation. Is that going to be postponed, or is that going to carry on? Do you, do you know the answer? I know that you're not responsible for it, but do you know the answer to that? I do know the answer to that. I know that the uh, the VOA, the Valuation Office uh, Agency, is continuing to work, and it's important that they do because some constituents um, who have businesses in Tunbridge Wells are going through an appeal against their valuation, um, and that appeal can be. The result of that appeal can be particularly important if they're reducing the rateable value and it takes them below the threshold to qualify for support. Uh, that is uh, that is crucial. So, so the VOA are working. Uh, I will uh, I will see if I can find out the answer uh, to the to the overall review and uh, and update people uh, through through the council or through my social media. Perfect, thank you. Uh, and just a few questions um, on the... Uh, sorry. William, William yeah. sorry to interrupt. Could I just come in on that point um, and, and just to reiterate to both you and Greg that, um, you know, the, lo the longer the enforced closure of businesses goes on, the, 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 the greater the uh, perception of inequity there is between those businesses in the, the sectors that are covered by the grants um, benefit and those that don't. You know, companies like service offices are are struggling. Um, you know, office-based businesses are struggling. I mean, I appreciate the the significant financial impact of suggesting that every business should in every sector should be eligible for grant. I mean, I mean that I would imagine is financially crippling. But there is there is a there is a, a case and, a, and a, a growing sense of unease and unfairness from, from businesses across the town centre that are saying, well, you know, it's all right for retailers, but what about me? Um, mm. And, and I, I think, you know, there, there does need to be a greater piece of work done by the Treasury to, to look at how other business sectors can be supported because they, they themselves will also be in, in significant um, risk of, of not being able to reopen after this shutdown period. So uh, just to comment on that, I think Ross is absolutely right. And uh, obviously, as the conversations turn to how we move beyond the, the initial period of lockdown, and you know, we're not quite there yet, the locally as well as nationally, the health services uh, is managing to, to cope. Um, uh, but at some point, we, we obviously can't continue this forever. My best assessment uh, is that the, uh, the the release of some of the restrictions will be gradual and will be sector by sector, different types of business by different types of business. And so, and so the reason for pointing that out is that actually this question of being more targeted and having schemes that recognise, perhaps with kind of greater sensitivity, the needs of different sectors, I think will inevitably accompany a strategy which is opening up certain parts of the economy but not others. There would be the quite reasonable requirement that those that can't open or are affected by uh, their customers or suppliers not being able to open uh, should be recognized in ongoing support, perhaps in a different way from those that are uh, released and encouraged to, uh, to trade normally where they can. So, so on, on the lockdown, Greg, I've had a question from a business that relies quite heavily on, you know, wedding bookings and, and other kind of hospitality. And they're saying that they're just in no man's land in terms of um, knowing when the restrictions are going to be lifted and how much notice will they be given. And, you know, if, if there isn't much notice or if things are gradual, as you were describing, whether the furlough scheme could take account of that and not just suddenly be switched off like, like a tap. Yes, well, I mean, this is the um, the big question, uh, isn't it, as to when uh, and how the uh, the restrictions can be lifted. At the moment, um, it, it's there hasn't been uh, as evident uh, a decision on how this uh, can be done yet. Looking at the the figures uh, on infections and hospital uh, admissions, they are uh, they're stable, but still at quite a high level. Um, so. 
it's not possible to to give a date uh, as to uh, as to when and which sectors uh, restrictions will be lifted at this point. But I know, and it's useful to uh, to hear from from that caller just how important it is for people to know as soon as uh, it's possible to give that information. People do need to uh, to plan ahead. People do need to decide whether to accept or uh, or reject bookings for some time in advance. So uh, as soon as that can be done, I obviously have no no power over that, have no uh, control over it. But in terms of representing the interests of my constituents, having as much notice as possible is clearly desirable. But that does require, uh, obviously, uh, an assessment uh, as to what the impact is going to be of opening things like shops, um, uh, venues where people gather, uh, and that assessment uh, has not been uh, made and published yet. Okay. So I, I know you... you, you You've got to get off. Um, there, there are two um, remaining questions. So I, I can either send these to you or if you've got time, you can answer them very quickly. So, so one is around the furlough scheme, which is just seeking clarification on what people can and can't do during furlough. So, for example, are they allowed just to reply to customers saying they can't deal with something now, they'll have to reschedule? Um, our business managers, we had this last time, this question, are they allowed to go to premises to deal with health and safety issues? And what if um, the... What, um, people who are self-isolating or in quarantine and the workers are furloughed um, and need to get to the premises. So, so those are just some of the sorts of detailed questions on, on how the scheme works. Well, uh, listen, I, I don't have the authority to be able to advise people that, you know, you can do this, you can't do that, not least because um, the, you know, the furloughing scheme is uh, it, one of the requirements is that people don't work and, um, and HMRC uh, we will not take my word for it if it comes to you doing something that I said you can do uh, and it turns out you can't. So uh, I think you do have to address them to uh, HMRC. If you have difficulty in doing so and you're one of my constituents, then uh, get in touch and email that. Uh, I mentioned this um, Martin Lewis um, uh, website. He does have a video uh, for on the furloughing scheme that goes through questions uh, like that, and um, uh, and he's he's able to uh, to to offer some uh, some advice based on his uh, experience uh, on that that it might be worth looking at. It's um, MoneySavingExpert.com, I think uh, his website is. All right, thanks very much, Greg. And the very last one, which I, I think is more for something for you to take away, which is uh, someone's um, expressed concern um, about the regulations um, on um, lockdown. Um, and including provisions such as people not leaving or being outside their place of work or leaving um, uh, people threatening to perform checks of people's shopping baskets and fines being issued and so on, and just the importance of such you know, stringent measures being um, subject to parliamentary scrutiny. Yeah, and this is, uh, this is a very important point. I, uh, some of you know I chair the, the Science and Technology Select Committee of the House of Commons um, and we we had an evidence session last week uh, in which we we heard from the government's principal scientific advisors on the experience of the the lockdown uh, and actually the what they they said was that people's adherence uh, to the lockdown was very high and much higher than actually could have been predicted uh, in advance. Uh, I think everyone has been very responsible and, and, and more so than was uh, predictable. Uh, and, uh, and I think because of that, that, that's been done because people recognize the need for it and recognize the responsibilities uh, to others, not least those working in the NHS and people who, if they contracted the virus, uh, it could be very serious. I think it comes from that rather than uh, a, a an aggressive enforcement, and I think in those cases where mistakenly police forces have posted tweets saying that they're going to be checking people's shopping baskets, it's had an immediate public outcry and has been resulted in uh, in the forces uh, taking them down and apologising pretty instantly. And I think that has to be the way to approach it. There is actually guidance that the um, the Association of Chief Police Officers has published uh, as to how to interpret the law, what is a reasonable uh, way to, uh, to to interpret things like, you know, can you drive to take exercise, uh, for example. Uh, it's it's worth looking at. It's, uh, if you just Google 
um, chief police officer's uh, advice, you'll find the, the document. Uh, and it says, for example, um, you know, a reasonable test of whether a journey is necessary in a car to take exercise uh, is that if the journey is less than the, the length of the exercise, that's fine. But actually, if you're traveling longer than you would spend exercising, then it's not fine. Uh, and there are other examples like that. And I think there is a pragmatic um, spirit that, that is informing that kind of uh, advice. I think these, these cases where it seems to be overzealous, they are exceptions. And I think the reason that they get as much attention and you know, they're right to is because actually it does uh, offend people's sense of you know, how we should be behaving on this. I think we're behaving well uh, together. People uh, are being sensible. And I think when we come to moving out, as I hope we will be able to, uh, some of these restrictions, uh, then uh, equally, I think we can uh, we can rely on people's sense of responsibility rather than a, a an over bureaucratic or kind of punitive approach. All right. Um, so th thanks very much indeed, Greg. Um, I think that's it from you. Um, so um, I don't know if you want to say any last words before you head off. Yeah. Th uh, thanks, William. And uh, really, just to uh, to recognise um, that this is was a complete shock to uh, uh, to everyone in, in business as it was to uh, to the country but but particularly for those in business coming out of quite a difficult uh, period not not the best time uh, to have had this and to you know, if things if decisions made by governments have had to be done uh, on the hoof and in much broader brush than uh, than is usual then for businesses who don't have that that depth of resource to have to make really difficult, sometimes impossible decisions, and to have the worry that I know many of you have about the future of businesses in which you've you know, literally invested your your life in every sense, kind of emotionally, family, and financially. Uh, uh, this is a a terrible time. Uh, I think we the, the advice that you've given and the and the the problems that you've brought to my attention have been really important in getting change. I, I don't think we would have had the furloughing scheme had it not been from the the chorus of voices, not just in Tunbridge Wells, but you know. But I managed to have the urgent question in Parliament, uh, which I think propelled the government to introduce a scheme like this. I'm going to do the same uh, with the loan scheme. So it is important that you know, however. Uh, uh, frustrated and in many cases justifiably angry you are uh, with the situation you're facing do let me know and let me uh, help advocate for uh, for change and improvement but uh, fundamentally and, and finally you know it's not going to be a happy situation at all until we can start to to lift these restrictions the key thing is that the the rate of infection uh, and hospitalisation uh, has to to fall to be manageable. But then I hope we will be able to have light at the end of the tunnel uh, for for every business on this call uh, for some a return to uh, to some kind of trading normality will come sooner than others. It's never going to get back to completely how it was uh, before for some time, uh, I suspect. But I think all of us. Uh, want to to see you trading and succeeding and, uh, and what you're doing and what you're soaking up during these last few weeks uh, is understood, recognized, and certainly on my, uh, from my point of view, deeply appreciated. All right. Thanks very much indeed, Greg. Um, so um, other things then. So Terry, um, we've had some um, sort of people asking what's going on in terms of uh, you know, community safety in, in, in the town. Do you want to come in and give a quick update? Yeah, can do. Thanks, William. Um, so while many businesses uh, obviously are closed, um, we are aware that some managers or staff do return to their premises from time to time to pick up mail or run water through the taps and perform other such tasks. And uh, in line with government guidance and with what Greg's just said about necessary journeys, um, I would encourage all businesses to make sure their premises are secure from time to time and to remove any assets that they can uh, realistically do. 
Uh, one local outdoor recreation area had a, a large theft of bikes uh, not too long ago, taken from their storage unit. Uh, and in hindsight, they could have removed them to a more secure location. Um, police patrols, they're still happening. Um, officers are making regular visits to businesses uh, in an effort to provide a visible presence uh, to support those businesses uh, that are still operating, particularly retail, obviously. Um, all those visits are logged and, and the outcomes are shared with senior officers. Uh, police community support officers also continues to go out daily and they're looking to engage and educate uh, anyone found to be in breach of the government guidelines. Um, our local uh, police inspector who I spoke to yesterday, he's asked me to let you all know that the Tunbridge Wells team has a dedicated crime prevention officer who can provide specific advice and conduct crime prevention surveys um, if, if you feel that might be uh, helpful. Locally, um, we haven't seen an increase in commercial burglaries or related offences. There was a small cluster of half a dozen offences uh, identified and attributed to one individual around two weeks ago, where the said individual broke into a vets and a beauty salon and was responsible for some vehicle interference in the town centre. Um, that person, thankfully, has now been charged and remanded. The CCTV control room, the operators down there, they'll be continuing to monitor the streets as usual um, and paying close attention to movement after dark, um, not only for taggers, um, graffiti vandals, as it were, um, but also for opportunists that might be looking for easy targets. Um, but obviously the cameras uh, can't see all sides of a premises, so those perimeter checks um, are important. And on the subject of graffiti, we do have some graffiti cleaning kits, uh, which we can make available for businesses, um, and they're good for most surfaces. Finally, um, if you have an alleyway or other hidden access, um, during those perimeter checks, just, just check for drug and alcohol paraphernalia, so that we might be a, made aware of any places where people might be congregating. Um, and, and perhaps as a slight aside to that, we we have very few rough sleepers in town at present, uh, thanks to uh, the great work of the housing team in the council and, and our outreach workers. Um, but there are a few hardy souls who won't accept support from us. So uh, do let us know also if you find bedding and, and other such things um, on or around your property. Uh, and we'll alert the outreach uh, support workers to, to pay a visit. Um, finally, finally, uh, if there are any questions or issues that you would wish to raise outside of this Q&A, because they're lengthy or complex or perhaps require some level of confidentiality, um, you can reach me through the business COVID-19 email address, um, or you can call the council switchboard and ask for community safety. Thank you. Ross, can I bring you in then to give an update on um, the Business Improvement District? And perhaps in doing it, I've had someone ask if you could repeat the websites for the change of rateable value threshold. So over to you. Yes, certainly. The, um, for, for the rateable threshold, the, the campaign has been launched by a, a number of bids and uh, sector bo trade bodies. Um, the, the website is raisethebarcampaign.com. That's raisethebarcampaign.com. Um, in terms of um, an update, I think I covered quite a lot of uh, what we've been doing in, in the opening uh, comments. Um, I would sort of reiterate what I said uh, at the beginning about the um, companies and, and those that are still trading, whether they are offering delivery, home deliveries, takeaways, um, or they are open because they are an essential retailer. Um, you know, there's the old adage, if you do nothing, nothing will happen. Um, and there are still quite a, a number of, of businesses that are not promoting them, themselves as effectively uh, as they could. So I would strongly urge them to sign up for the twdelivery.co.uk website. Um, and also to, to, you know, if, if they are sort of more wary or more bashful about social media, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook are all great places to um, to sort of to grow your online audience, um, we're promoting every everyone that come that's online and is using the hashtag TW delivers 
um, we are promoting and we're also pushing out um, listings on a daily basis of those companies that are open and that are offering deliveries. Um, it's an organic process. Some businesses are opening and closing all the time, so the list is, is not 100% accurate all the time, but we're working hard to make sure that it's kept as up to date as possible. For those retailers that are open, we have a supply of um, two meter social distancing stickers uh, that can be applied to the floor space, both inside and outside those uh, premises. Anyone that wants those just has to uh, get in touch. Um, there's quite a bit of information about the bid. And um, for those of you that, that are listening that aren't part of the Tunbridge Wells Together uh, catchment area, we are a business improvement district for the town centre. There's about 700 uh, businesses that are eligible. We are funded exclusively by those businesses. Um, we are here to to represent them um, through a one-off levy on the rateable value of premises, um, which is different from um, the, the business rates uh, themselves. As I said, we'll be um, having a, a social media and a business uh, survival webinar next Thursday, the 30th at 10.30, and we'll, I'll be pushing information out about that through our newsletter. Um, one other thing I'd like to say is that I've had quite a few phone calls this last week from Levy Pair saying, well, we don't really know what, what you're doing. We don't really um, understand how you can help us at, at, at this time. Um, we, we, we're doing, obviously, the same as any organisation. We're doing as much as we can to communicate. We're doing that principally through uh, electronic communication. So any business that's listening that isn't uh, receiving our regular newsletters and email updates do get in touch the other thing to say is i know and understand that everyone is busy but if you don't read those uh, newsletters and updates then you won't be um privy to all the the activities and the support that we are providing whether that's peer-to-peer -peer support one-to-one -one support through email and, and phone calls um social media promotion uh, and business listings so you know do do keep in, in touch with us um we're, we're here to to help you as much as we can a specific question um about yeah. whether, about whether and how people can view the accounts for the bids can you just explain to people how they can access them yeah, absolutely. So as I said before, the, the, the bid is exclusively funded by businesses in the town centre. Um, we were established a year ago with a, with a remit to cover five years based on a uh, published business plan or, or some manifesto, as, as some refer to it as. In the business plan, it outlined how, we, how much income we would generate through the, through the levy uh, each year and in broad terms what the budget would be per year for how that money would be spent. The business plan was put together based on consultation with businesses themselves. So it's, it's directly being generated by uh, businesses in the town centre. Um, obviously, at the moment, that budget is, is um, movable. Um, as I say, we, we're funded by the business community, and it's, it's totally the wrong time to be asking for levy payments. Um, thankfully, we have had about 15% of our levy income for this year already, which means we can continue the work that we're doing. In terms of the first year of our activities, um, we were a limited company, so our accounts will be published and presented on Companies House in the way that they, will, they would be for every limited company. Um, but, but because we are a business improvement district, we are also required to prepare and publish an annual report. And that report is being put together at the moment. Uh, and once it has been prepared, it will it will be both a written report, but also a financial report on, on what, what money we've generated, where we've spent that money, and what the outcome uh, of that expenditure was. Um, obviously, we've only just come to the end of the financial year, so our bookkeeper is uh, busily preparing the accounts at the moment, which will be sent off to our uh, independent accountants for audit and, pro and uh, processing. They will then be signed off by the board of directors, and once that's happened, uh, they'll be uploaded both to the company's house website, where they're available for everyone to see, but also we will uh, prepare and publish the annual report that will go out in electronic format to every levy pair. So it's, it's a fully transparent set of accounts uh, for what we do. Perfect. Thanks so much, Ross. So a few things from me then. Um, so we've had a question about highways, and um, Tunbridge Wells Borough Council isn't the Highways Authority, that's Kent County Council. Um, but the question was whether um, advantages 
being taken of the fact that there aren't as many vehicles on the road and whether um, we're taking that opportunity to do the repairs. Uh, and the answer is yes, Kent County Council are doing that. Um, they're working throughout the lockdown period. Um, they're, um, th they're slightly modifying their approach. So where there are um, lots of people and parked cars because everyone's working from home, they're avoiding those areas so as to not inconvenience people and they're working elsewhere. They're having some issues with materials um, and contractors who shut down. Um, I, I was hearing today that the um, public realm works we're doing around the war memorial, the remaining stone we need to, to finish up is locked um, in a yard somewhere in the Midlands and we can't get access to it. But curiously, if it had come in from China, we could have done so. Um, that their advice is to absolutely carry on reporting faults. Um, there's a website which is kent.gov.uk slash highway faults, all one word, or ring them in on 03000 418181. So that's the answer to that. Um, the next question was in relation to whether or not the town could have a university um, to kickstart the local economy. Um, and help um, stop the town becoming a dormitory town and deliver more bars and cafes and so on. Um, th th we have now got a university campus, which is the uh, Christchurch um, University at Canterbury, have got their applied psychology department based in, um, uh, based in town. And um, I understand, well, that was working very well indeed, and they, they were looking to expand. Um, but. I, I suspect we're not going to get much more from the university sector in the near future. Um, from contacts I've had, they've been very severely affected by um, the, the lockdown and the withdrawal of um, funding from, from students from, from overseas. Uh, the next question was around planning um, and asking whether or not um, we're able to carry on um, working our way through applications. And the answer is yes. Uh, the um, that the government's chief planner has been very clear that we'll continue to need homes for people to live in and jobs for people to, to do, you know, with, with, with new economic developments. Um, the planning team, um, obviously, it's working differently, um, but they are very much um, continuing to process applications and the determination of applications remain high. Um, I think since uh, between, uh, we've had 141 applications determined um, 84% within the statutory timetable um, compared with 95 and 69% within the same period uh, in 2019. Uh, and we're looking um, from next month to start running virtual planning committees um, using Skype for Business. So that's the answer on planning. Uh, and the building control department's also operating at full capacity as well. Um, I've had a, a, a question on garden waste um, uh, for, from Matt Sankey saying that um, he and his wife have started a new hobby gardening. Um, and he said, it's a bit of a red rag to a bull, um, that the government's increased funding to councils and can uh, he expect his garden bin to be collected. So just quickly on the so supposed increased funding to local governments, um, a, what, an announcement of £1.6 billion was made some weeks ago. Our share of that as Tunbridge Wells Borough Council was £41,000 or about 35 p per residence. Uh, and at the moment, uh, the losses in our income alone are running to around £50,000 a day, so it doesn't even cover 24 hours loss of income. And on top of that, we're incurring significant additional um, expense, um, you know, for example, you know, delivering food to the vulnerable, setting up hubs, um, a whole variety of things. So that, that's the funding point. On, on the black bins, we're keeping that under constant review. Um, the last conversation we had with our contractor was just this morning, um, and they still are experiencing issues with um, you know, n not having a full complement of staff um, and our judgment and their judgment is it's much more important to get, um, you know, the, the residual waste sorted, medical waste sorted, recycling and, and food waste. So that's what we're prioritising. But we keep that under constant review. Um, the I think let me see whether there's anything that's come through by way of any other questions. Um, I've had one um, on whether um, we can uh, business asking whether businesses could let us know of any buy now use later offers that can help um, promote and, and pass on to partners. Um, so we're, we're very uh, happy to receive those. And I'm having a scroll through things that have come in. And I think 
that is um, the totality of what we've received. So if anyone else has had any other questions from social media, can you send them through to me now? Um, but failing that, can I ask whether Councillor Jane March is on the phone? Jane? So, so J Jane is our cabinet member for economic development, and I'm afraid um, she's been dropping um, in and out of the call. Um, I know that she had hoped to conclude the call just by saying um, a huge thank you to all of you. Um, we, we absolutely appreciate the extraordinary circumstances and how difficult it is for you. We've also been blown away by the support that a huge number of businesses are giving um, to support the community, whether that's through food, distribution, accommodation, support to frontline workers, support to the homeless. We, we really do appreciate it. Um, as I said at the beginning, um, if you haven't applied for your business rate grant, please do. Um, 63% have, 37% haven't. haven't. Um, if you've got any inquiries, um, just to remind you that there is um, a number you can call, which is the Kenton Medway Growth Hub. That number is 0333 302 um, or you can email the uh, address that was given at the beginning of the call. So I'm just going to throw it open. If anyone wants to say any last words, no. In that case, can I thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us uh, and wish you all the very best. Thank you.